Hi everybody, Frank Pound here from AstroSec. Today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this topic called space resilience as it relates to the Hackasat hacking competition that was started by the Air Force and Space Force uh, nearly two years ago. Uh, I've been involved with, uh, with that project for quite some time and the recurring theme obviously is how to make more secure space architectures uh, and with the Hackasat program uh, we used a small satellite model uh, and a ground station uh, as sort of the, the centerpiece of, of the competition uh, to try to showcase uh, you know, what could be done by an adversary, but also showcase what could be done uh, by defenders to make for a more resilient uh, space architecture. So what does it mean to be uh, resilient in space? Well, first, let's think back to 30 years ago and uh, the, the organizations that were involved uh, in space operations, launching satellites into space. Um, everybody thinks of a satellite as this you know, sort of big square with solar panels sticking out the sides and big antennas sitting up in space and providing some sort of service. Um, some of those services could be communications, um, you know, facilitating the, the watching of live, live sports like the Olympics, which are going on right now. Uh, there's lots of satellites involved in relaying those communications from Japan uh, to ground stations across the globe and distributing that video for everyone to see. So communication satellites historically have been you know, the, one of the primary uh, things people think about when they think about objects in space that are performing some sort of service. Uh, we also have spy satellites up there that take pictures of certain places on Earth and we have other sensors uh, that are part of scientific missions that NASA um, and the European Space Agency and others have launched uh, for deep space exploration. Specifically, what I'm going to talk about though is uh, not so much about satellites that are uh, performing those functions of communications or spy satellites or things like that. What I want to focus on though is this uh, new space economy. And the new space economy is enabled by the democratization of a lot of technologies uh, that are now within reach of, uh, of just about anyone uh, with, uh, with a little bit of a budget and some imagination. Uh, it's, it's come time today where if you have an idea uh, that involves collecting data from space, it's not so hard to realize that idea, uh, build your own spacecraft, uh, pay uh, a, a moderate sum of money uh, to get that spacecraft uh, launched alongside dozens of others uh, through economy of scale, uh, sort of pioneered by SpaceX and others, uh, and get your platform in orbit to collect that data. Um, a lot of people are thinking about monetizing that data, uh, you know, swipe your credit card and get pictures of your backyard, things like that. So how does resilience relate to that? Well, the thing is, if you think back, there's a parallel to this, and the parallel is the, the origin of the internet. The, the internet was created uh, back in the 60s and 70s uh, for the purpose of uh, resilient communications. However, one of the, the issues with uh, the creation of the internet is uh, folks only thought of it as a, as a capability to, to recover from a catastrophic nuclear war. Uh, and people didn't really think about the fact that, well, the internet itself could be attacked or, or used for malice. And so for many, many years in the 70s and 80s and early 90s, the internet sort of grew up in this sort of protected club-like atmosphere uh, only used by governments and universities and it was never really exposed to sort of the, the general malice of the, of the global community. And the same thing potentially could happen uh, in the new space economy as folks are starting to create these great ideas and, and great monetization platforms for space. Well, what follows is the criminal syndicates and the other, you know, maybe not so uh, friendly nation states who want to sort of take advantage of those, uh, of those new resources that are being you know, funded and paid for by their adversaries. And so we must be resilient to that sort of thing. So how are we going to be more resilient? Well, we can look back again to the, to the creation of the internet and we can start to think about how can we design in security from day one? How can we think about more resilient designs uh, from day one? Um, part of that comes with thinking like the adversary. Um, thinking like the adversary means, you know, if you're a hacker, um, what would you do to try to break into your, uh, your competitor's systems? 
Um, and so, so that means looking at the ground stations, looking at the software that goes into the ground stations, looking at the communication links that connect the ground stations together, um, looking at the antenna segments that receive the data that goes into the ground station, and then looking at the, the, the protocols that are used to communicate to the satellites in space, um, looking at the satellites themselves. And, and so um, we, we did all this in the Hackasat project. Um, the engineers who built the competition framework, a uh, group called Cromulence, actually built a real world model of a flat sat uh, to enable us to act like adversaries and actually run to ground some of these potential vulnerabilities that we saw or that we're, that we're perceiving. And, uh, and it was so successful, they're, they're going to do it again with Hackasat uh, 2.0. So um, in summary, you know, resilience really means understanding, you know, thinking about the vulnerabilities that exist and thinking about ways to mitigate those vulnerabilities with practical application of good engineering thought and good engineering designs. more security researchers in the industry we need the existing security researchers that that are out there to, to connect with uh, the space an aerospace community and it, it isn't enough to have them come in after the fact and to do a security assessment at the end uh, we need the researchers to be a part of the development team and include them in the entire life cycle of these systems welcome to space security challenge 2020 Hackasat, the final event. As the democratization of space opens up a new frontier for exploration and innovation, we see new cybersecurity vulnerabilities emerging. The Space Security Challenge is designed to inspire the world's top cybersecurity talent to develop the skills necessary to secure this last frontier of cybersecurity, space. Every federally funded lab is chartered with the mission of technology transfer. Technology transfer is all about taking government-owned intellectual property and transferring it to the public domain. The Air Force Research Lab and our charter to perform tech transfer put us in the best position to lead this effort. But first, we had to overcome the monumental task of convincing people that hacking a satellite was actually a good thing to do in the name of improving space security. But we persevered and our mission fueled the creation of what we called the Space Security Challenge 2020 Hackasat. At the heart of it, we needed to create a community where one didn't currently exist. And we wanted to leverage the challenge model because we've learned a lot from DARPA and they've been very successful at creating communities through challenges. And so DARPA created this challenge back in like 2004, bringing together the AI industry, the sensor industry or community, and also the automotive industry to, to formulate a challenge to improve the security of the automotive industry leveraging AI. Now you fast forward 15 years, we have a fully functioning industry of autonomous vehicles. And that's ultimately where we're going with Space Security Challenge Hackasat. We want to build trust and security into our space systems. So we needed to get the attention of the hacker community. And we're not typically, as the Air Force and now Space Force, we're not trying to do outreach to the hacker community. So we had a new, unique challenge on our hands. We also needed to get the attention of policymakers and um, the general public and industry. We needed people to care about this because it affects all of us. And then the pandemic hit. And all of our plans to run the finals at DEF CON to build an audience of tens of thousands of DEF CON tracks shattered. So we pivoted. So we needed to figure out a way to hold finals virtually and still achieve our goal of cultivating a research community. And it became apparent that this pivot to virtual was actually more of an opportunity. It was an opportunity to reach people who wouldn't have normally been able to travel to DEF CON. 
but there were huge challenges associated with this for both the competitors and the spectators. So in July, we shipped each team leader a flat sat, which came with an air bearing. And what the teams could do is they could put their flat sat on top of the air bearings, and then they could use the attitude control system in the flat sat to be able to rotate the flat sat to kind of emulate what it would be like if they were in space. But with COVID, what we didn't anticipate were the global shipping timelines. Two of our teams didn't get their flat sats until later. In fact, the third place team, Flux Repeat Rocket, didn't even receive their flat sat until the morning of the competition on August 7th. That was a real nail biter. Then there were the spectators. After all, the world is watching now. We needed to be able to give people all over the world a way to feel like they were part of the action. So we built this fully immersive 3D environment for spectators to explore, and watch the competition. We did our best to give it a DEF CON feel so that people really felt like they were still part of that environment that we worked so hard to be part of. And so as part of this environment, we created this extensive library of content and videos. And so all of the content that we created on Hackasat, as well as all of the videos that were created are available on our GitHub page and our YouTube channel, and where you can access that information and continue to learn about hacking, cyber, and space. The scenario was based around a mock stolen satellite. So once the teams are on the satellite, the remaining challenges had to do with removing the presence of the malicious actor that was on that satellite, orient it so that they could then use the imager to take a photo of the moon that we had set up inside of the facility where the flat sets were all located. The other part of the challenge, the teams were tasked with coming up with a command set that would point an actual satellite at the actual moon. Uh, teams were given a very limited amount of time to accomplish that goal, and one of them was uh, able to successfully take a photo of the moon using that command set. Uh, we're going to answer the question as to which team had their code sent into space tonight. Congrats to Team Poland Can Into Space for submitting uh, not only the best solution overall throughout the whole evaluation period, but the solution that is going to space. We expect the moonshot to happen in a couple of hours at 6.30 Pacific, and that picture will be sent down to Earth at about 1 a.m. Pacific. There will be people who are hacking satellites. And so by having the federal government structure this in a nice, organized, and safe way, we can do it without getting in any trouble, and they can get the results and the understanding that they need from an attacker's perspective. Having the ability to approach something with the mindset of, you know, how could I break this always helps you understand how a system works better. It's something we all, as a community, have to be thinking about. And the security, the security community wants to be a part of that. They, they would like to be involved with these systems. They would like to secure these systems. They would like to learn more about these systems. Uh, so, so openness and transparency um, and, and getting access to more of these systems going forward. And, and we need the space community, uh, the aerospace community, to be open and available and receptive to that. Um, and that's what we were trying to accomplish with Hackasat, put on a game that, that brought those two communities together and raised that awareness. And I, I think we did a good job of that. Uh, now we hand the ball off uh, maybe to, to the aerospace community to, to take that forward. Last thing. Thanks for joining us. The future of space security depends on the work we're doing together. Based on experiences with Hackasat 1, most of us expected Hackasat 2 to be pretty challenging. Qualifiers, which took place back in June, did not disappoint. Hello, I'm Vito, and we're going to talk about the challenges Fiddlin' John Carson and Cotton Eye Geo. When you connect to the server for Fiddlin' John Carson, it gives you a position vector, a velocity vector, and the current time, and then prompts you for some orbit parameters. From some quick internet searches, I figured out that the challenge is asking you to convert the Cartesian position and velocity vectors into Keplerian orbital parameters. I haven't really done any orbital mechanics in over a decade, and that was all, you know, two-dimensional, so we're going to have to learn how to do this together. Cartesian coordinates tell you where you are and how you're moving in a space of right angles. The International Celestial Reference Frame, or ICRF from this challenge, 
differs from latitude and longitude in some very important ways. So a problem with latitude and longitude is that the distance in kilometers per degree of travel changes as you move around. For example, moving south, like I am right now, you get more meters per degree the closer you get to the equator. Similarly, the farther away I move from sea level, like whenever I climb these stairs up here, that also means there are more meters per degree of travel. Down here, you know, at sea level, it's not super significant. But it, when you're orbiting and moving really, really fast, really, really high, it's another matter entirely. ICRF coordinates are in a three-dimensional grid. One coordinate goes roughly north-south through the center of the Earth, and the others are at right angles to that, and also each other. They're keyed to a bunch of quasars and that kind of thing super far outside our galaxy, so that as we move through the solar system, and the solar system moves through the universe, the coordinates don't change too much. However, the six numbers, three position, three velocity, don't actually tell us very much about the orbit. We'd like to know what altitudes it ranges through, where do you have to point a dish or antenna to see it, and that kind of thing. To do that, it's useful to convert them into Keplerian orbital parameters, which describe the shape of the orbit, where it goes, and where the satellite is on it right now. That's the quick version. I found this website to be really useful to understand what all these different parameters mean. So how do you actually solve this challenge? Let's see how the team's single event upset did it. They started with the Orbital Pi Python module, which also produces really nice plots. I'm recreating these in a Jupyter notebook simply because it makes the plots easy to see and also export. Their code to solve Finland John Carson is pretty simple. They use an Orbital Pi function to turn an ICRF state vector, which is the position and velocity, into most of the Keplerian elements. Then they calculate the degrees for the true anomaly because Orbital Pi likes to work in radians and print that out too. Next, let's talk about the sequel to Fiddle and John Carson, Cotton Eye Geo. Like any sequel, it starts where the previous one ends. The spacecraft is still in orbit, but now we have to provide a delta v or change in velocity vector and time to execute that change in velocity to put us into a brand new orbit. Getting from one orbit to another is done by changing your velocity at a specific time. Increasing your forward velocity at the highest point in your orbit increases your altitude at the lowest point. Decreasing your velocity at the lowest point in your orbit decreases your altitude at the highest point. Since we're in an elliptic orbit already, which means we vary through a wide range of altitudes, and the challenge wants us to get into a low eccentricity or more circular orbit, we have to burn at our highest point, which is also called the apocenter. The single event upset solution begins with their Fidlin John Carson solution. From there, they propagate the orbit until the satellite's at the apocenter. That's the highest point. This means simulating the orbit from the current true anomaly, or where the spacecraft is, until the true anomaly is at 180 degrees. This is a relatively cheap simulation. It's a few trigonometry and other math operations without any time stepping where errors can creep in. Once we're at our apocenter, we create a maneuver to change the altitude at our lowest point or pericenter. We can calculate a first guess. The challenge wants us to set the semi-major axis to about, you know, approximately 42,164 kilometers with a basically circular eccentricity. We subtract 6,371 kilometers for the Earth's radius and tell Orbital to make a maneuver to set our pericenter altitude to 35,793 kilometers. That makes a bunch of scary looking warnings and the Orbital source code kinda suggests that it's having trouble calculating our eccentricity vectors from that. Going a kilometer lower avoids the warnings, but we're still too high. Some more trial and error gets us to a pericenter altitude of 35,762 kilometers, which avoids the warnings and meets our eccentricity goals. Once we've taken our delta v vector and keyed it into the challenge, we get a flag back, and that's it. Thanks for joining me while solving Fidlin John Carson and Cotton Eye Geo. Hi, 
I'm Deadwood of the Hackassett technical team. We are the developers and organizers of the Hackassett Quals and Finals competition. For Hackassett 2020, the top eight teams from Quals competed in the finals over the DEF CON weekend in a head-to-head -head race to solve a series of challenges. The challenges involved anomaly analysis and resolution, satellite operations, reverse engineering, and of course exploitation on an engineering model satellite or FlatSat. The FlatSat ran a real flight software framework called CFS that was created by NASA and was commanded with the Cosmos Command and Control software from Ball Aerospace. To up the stress level a little bit, teams were also required to complete the on-orbit challenge. Developing a command plan for a live satellite to orient itself to take a picture of the moon while simultaneously continuing to perform in the main hacking competition. For 2021, we're going to take it up a notch. Finalists still had to win their spot by proving their knowledge and skill in the qualifier, but instead of finals being a race to the finish, it is going to be a classic attack and defend CTF, but on a space system platform similar to last year's. Teams will score points by attacking vulnerabilities in the other team's systems. Teams must protect their own system by patching or otherwise mitigating those same vulnerabilities. Teams will get SLA points by keeping their system operating nominally. But this is a space system, and keeping it in the required state might be just a little more involved than ensuring all of its services are running with their intended functionality. The skills that teams need aren't much different or any different at all than last year's. Teams will need to understand architectures and technologies that are used in space systems. They will need to understand operating a system that is orbiting the Earth. They will need to understand communication systems. They will need to be able to reverse engineer at both the system level and also binary applications. They, of course, will need to be able to patch binaries and craft exploits. What is new for this year is they will need to be able to understand the strategy and tactics for playing an attack and defend CTF. The game type is not the only upgrade for 2021. The flat set from last year is being almost completely rebuilt with new hardware and processor architectures to provide a diverse platform for hosting challenges. The system will include an upgraded command and data handler, or CMDH, an all new attitude determination and control system, or ADCS, a power distribution board, and a special payload module. The payload's hardware features will provide for a very unique CTF challenge or two. Teams are going to get the opportunity to familiarize themselves with a new flight software ahead of the competition with a digital twin. The digital twin is a system of system simulation of the actual flight software. It runs in a QMU-based emulator called HOG. HOG extends QMU by providing a rich plug-in API that allows for custom hardware and interface simulations without having to add them to the QMU baseline itself. For example, it's a HOG plugin that emulates the satellite bus used for subsystem communications allowing multiple HOG instances running on emulations of various flat set components to communicate over the plugin without knowing they aren't using the actual hardware bus. Using this digital twin technology allows for distributing copies of the game software to teams wherever they are. HOG also provides a GDB interface allowing teams introspection into the running emulation, which might prove useful when developing patches and exploits before using them live in the game. Since the finals competition is virtual again this year, Teams and spectators both will need access to game information to understand what is going on. In addition to a traditional CTF scoreboard, FlatSat specific telemetry for each team will be visible in real time via instances of NASA's Open Mission Control Technologies. The OpenMCT dashboard is viewable from our web browser and will display key state of health data so spectators can keep track of their favorite team's efforts to operate their satellites while defending it from the attacks of the other teams. Satellites will also be progressing through simulated real-time orbits around the Earth. Spectators will be able to see visualizations of these orbits produced by the Cesium 3D geospatial tool. Not only will Cesium display where a satellite is in its orbit, but it will accurately display a satellite's attitude and orientation. A satellite tumbling in its orbit is probably not in a healthy condition and has probably been attacked. We are excited about the evolution of this year's competition and look forward to seeing the skill, creativity, and tenacity teams will demonstrate to become the Hackazat 2 champion for 2021. Three, two, one. Hi everybody, I'm Aaron Bolin, one of the Space Force leads for Hackazat. If you followed along in the Hackazat saga, you know that now more than ever, it's imperative to get space system security design right. You may have also heard about our special project called Moonlighter, 
which is a first of its kind satellite aimed at doing just that. Think a cyber sandbox in space. Moonlighter will allow cyber professionals like you to take your skills learned through Hackasat events and apply them to a live operational satellite. There is a general accepted theory within space vehicle design to bake in cyber. With Moonlighter, we're going to bring you along on the ride and put that to the test. By presenting intentionally designed challenges based on all the data and feedback from previous Hackasat events, Moonlighter will represent the best of ideas and operational concepts. We believe that Moonlighter will be an education accelerator and idea generator for events like DEF CON in the near future. Never before has there been an opportunity to develop, design, and launch a satellite like Moonlighter. And Moonlighter. We are so thrilled to be able to bring this technology to play in 2023. Please be sure to follow along with everything pertaining to Moonlighter at hackasat.com. Thank you so much for being with us today. Stay safe and happy hacking. SWXM Space Country. Thanks for tuning in. If you decoded my clues and gathered all the pieces of this disc, you must be one of the best security researchers in the galaxy. And I guess you believe that rumor about the legendary hacker hidden in space working to design the ultimate cybersecurity key. Well, you're right. Call me Fox. You've proved yourself worthy to know my location. You're welcome to stop by any time. But once you're here, you'll have to help me train the best minds on the planet to become even better. I'm looking for the elite few with the skills and knowledge to hack in space to be the first to experience Project Moonlighter. Thank you.